Okay, next up is, and he's here to talk to us about uh, interactive uh, coding with big data analytics. And uh, Sam has, uh, uh, he's just recently back from Albania, I understand, right? Yes, that's right. And so he is now a recognized expert in where to go to get um, peppers in yogurt in Albania. So, uh, you know, you can also stick around and ask him questions afterwards about that. And I'm sure he'll share his knowledge. And in all seriousness, Albania has a wonderful tech scene. Um, really, really cool. If anybody's curious about that, come find me afterwards and I'll talk to you about it. Um, <coughs> so I'm Sam. I work in Mozilla as per the gracious introduction there. Um, and I learned on the job how to work with terabyte scale distributed data. And my goal in this talk is to save you some of the hair pulling, what the heck is going on learning on the job that I did. And in particular, I'm going to give you a clear mental model for what is different when you are working with clusters of computers and terabytes of data. And I'm going to offer up a core technique, which it seems to me um, deals with the specific problems that I've encountered in a few years of this and in consulting with a few dozen and training training my colleagues as they come under the task. Um, let me go back one quick. Um, and this is, in case it isn't obvious, a talk for coders. Um, so these gentlemen are two people to whom everyone in this room owes a great debt. They gave us Unix and C. Um, and there they are developing these wonderful tools that we all rely on every day. And <coughs> they also gave us printf. And the print there is not a metaphor. There's a big roll of paper there that if they want to inspect the state of a variable to figure out what's going on in their function that they didn't anticipate, well, they print it out on paper. And I would argue that what they're doing there, printing out things on paper to see what's up with their code, is the heart of the craft of coding, right? You take some working code, you make a little change, you run it, and if you're confused by what happened or an error and exceptions thrown, you either step through it in a debugger or you drop in a few print statements if you're old school like me, and you observe the program state so that you know what the problem is. This is super, super basic, but I want to be really clear about it because it is what is what goes away when you're dealing with distributed big data coding. So this is a Python prompt. This dates from about 1990, which is closer in time, let us note, to those ge two gentlemen than today. Um, yet we still work with it. It's tremendously productive. It looks like a bash shell, and here it is giving us some reasonable size local state, in this case, the directory path that I'm working in. Here's a more modern interface. This one's about 10 years old. Have any of you used Jupyter Notebooks before? Yeah, a bunch of you. Cool. So this is a web page that is sending strings that I've typed in of Python through a web socket back to a Python interpreter on a Unix machine and then returning the value of the expression after they've evaluated it. So this looks like this, except, you know, it's black on white instead of white on black, and you know, I can use my mouse, pretty cool. Well, this is also the interface that is used for a lot of distributed big data coding, and guess what? Things are a little different underneath the hood. So um, this is an amateurish diagram because I drew it. I drew it because I could not find a good professionally done diagram that I thought did justice to the architecture, and I would argue that this even itself is another simplification. So what we just looked at here, this screen that I'm typing into, is the little blue box at the bottom labeled my web browser. That is SSH tunneling into Amazon Web Services, which happens to be my cloud provider, um, connecting to a Jupyter process running on a cluster I've started up on the master node, which is connecting to IPython and evaluating that Python command I sent. Python, in turn, is a child of Spark, which is a distributed um, computing framework, which is very popular. The reason we're using Python is that data scientists know Python and not Scala in general, um, which is the native language of Spark. And so what happens when you distribute a command is it gets serialized and sent through the Spark chain out to distributed Python workers. And then, of course, all of this, the entire point of spinning up a compute cluster is that we have a lot of data, right? And in our case, it's on S3. And that line cutting across the corner there is my attempt to draw a curve with a really big diameter. And the thing here is that scale is hard for our, our little human brains to reason about, right? How many people have seen this image before? It's awesome. Look it up on Wikipedia. So it starts off, the first two are planets in our solar system. 
And the biggest object in one thing is the smallest object in the next, right? And what you see if you look, particularly at numbers four and five, is that the tiny little dot in number four is actually much bigger than our sun. And the tiny little dot in number five is much, much bigger than this thing that's much, much bigger. So this is orders of magnitude. And we can't really represent them with one image. It's too hard. And that's the challenge I faced when I was drawing this. And it's a challenge you face in your head when you're trying to cope with this stuff. You're not going to directly observe program state if you've got billions of rows. If you step through it, you will die of old age before you finish. So what does this mean in practice? Here is a traceback that happened, true story. I had some ETL code. It was working great. I'd moved on. One day, I get an alert. There's a problem. And I start to read this traceback. OK, that doesn't tell me anything. Let's scroll down and see what's really going on. Well, 30 more screens of nonsense, and I get to this. Everybody figured it out right now? You see the root cause? No, I don't see the root cause. This traceback is not very helpful. I need a technique that is equivalent in power to the one that we've been relying on for 40 years. But I can't use that same technique. I need a new one. So <clears throat> the good news is that as you stumble through these problems, you'll realize that there are three kinds of problems you're going to encounter. Crashes in two flavors, slowness, and then one that is arguably unique to distributed big data co programming, which is that everything seems to work great, but you don't believe the results. And how can you double check them if the results are generated from billions of rows? I'm also going to argue that there are only a few underlying causes, and I'm going to go over these in detail, so I'm not going to read this slide to you. But great, Sam. Thanks for the taxonomy. You haven't actually told me how I can solve this. I need to map from what I'm experiencing to what Sam up here is asserting are the underlying causes. And the rest of this talk is about how you do that. So recall that when you drop a printf into a little local function with human scale values, that you're making the program state observable. And that tells you what the problem is. Well, when the program state is the size of some giant star, you can't do that. But what you can do is make the problem state observable. And to make it observable, you've got to make it local. If it's still out there in the cloud, you can't see it. And then the second part, excuse me, is that when you scale out and up, you need to do so in discrete stages so that you can triangulate better on the problem. <clears throat> so here is something you might see. You might see a traceback. Previously, we had a traceback that ended with an error occurred, which made me want to throw my computer. This one ends with a type error. Is anybody intimidated by type errors? Have any of you ever had a type conflict in your code? I would guess that every single one of us does on something like a daily or weekly basis. Type errors are the bread and butter of debugging code. We all know how to fix them. And what had happened in this case was that there was a none that had crept in where I expected there to be a string that looked like a floating point number. That's no big deal. What I want you to notice about here is that if I get a type error in the traceback down here in this box in the bottom, that that type error originated out in one of those yellow Python worker boxes out in the node. So the key, the, this core technique is being applied by the framework. The framework is taking the problem state, which happened way out there in the cloud somewhere, and it's bringing it down and putting it in front of me. It's making the problem state locally observable to me. Now this, you might argue, is not very interesting, except I want to show that the two techniques, the Ritchie and Thompson technique and this technique I'm arguing, in this case are the same. Now let's look at a slightly more interesting case. So this is something I did one morning when I hadn't had enough coffee. I wanted to grab the week's worth of data, so I dropped an ISO formatted date string into a where clause to filter down um, 10 to the 10th rows into roughly 10 to the 9th. And there were no rows in line two, right? I should have billions of rows, and I've got none of them. What the heck? That's impossible, right? I don't expect this. Well, it turned out I was lucky. I had made such a bad mistake that it applied to every single row in the entire data. Can everybody see what the problem is? 
the date was formatted differently and I was doing a string comparison, right? So that meant that the bounds were, lexicographically, the bounds of my where clause were totally outside the way the dates were written there. And so no rows were matching the clause. All I needed to do was take the hyphens out of my where clause and it would have gotten the dates correctly, right? So in this case, I made the problem state locally observable by grabbing an arbitrary number of rows. And in case it isn't clear, that dot take function is saying, go out to the cluster and just give me 40 rows. I don't know which ones they're going to be, but just give me 40 so I can start to play around. So the key technique of making the problem state locally observable in this case was easy because the problem state was in every row, right? So at this point you're thinking, great Sam, this is not rocket science. I probably could have figured this out by myself. And indeed, pretty much everybody does who's doing this coding. But there are trickier problems. So let's say you've tried these two things. You've read the traceback. You've looked at a few rows. There's no clue. What do you do? You go on to the second point. You start scaling up and out, but you do so in steps. The first thing you want to do is you want to scale out without scaling up. So you, you had a traceback, you had some crazy problem you don't understand, you bring in a little data, you run it locally just the way Richie and Thompson would have. Everything's great, there's no problem here, but you know there's a problem out there. How do you get from here to there? The first thing you do is you take the code and data that worked perfectly locally and you distribute that code and that data and run it again there is a chance that just the active distribution will reveal it. And on the screen is an example of how it can happen in Python. If you are relying locally on some code that you haven't installed on all the uh, different Python workers out in your box, you'll get a problem. <coughs> Let's say you get past that one. Now we're getting into more interesting problems. So now you want to start scaling out taking more and more data and do so in chunks. Probably don't go to 100% because nothing's going to change, right? At this point, you can expect one of three things to happen. Either you're going to get another what I'm calling code data problem, like that type error that we've seen before, or you're going to get a problem that looks more like the one where there were 30 screens and it ended with an error occur. And I'm calling those tool chain panics, and I'd actually be curious to know if anybody knows of a better term of art for that an exception or an error which is in the stuff you're relying on and not in your code. And then finally, you might see that runtime is increasing exponentially, which means you're headed for a toolchain panic. So toolchain panics are pretty straightforward, easy to recognize it's not in your code and it's in some namespace of something that looks like the framework you're using, right? Pretty straightforward. <coughs> so let's say you have a code data problem You've got this type error when you're calling float, but it's somewhere out there. It's not in your sample data. What do you do? Well, you change your function that is going out and touching every node in the cloud, and instead of calling float and blowing up, you tell it, call float. If you don't blow up, don't do anything. Return nothing. If you do blow up, return, catch the blow up and return that row. And then you'll have a data set which consists exclusively of the rows that your code can't handle. And then you can bring them back locally, look at them, and see, oh, there's a none there. Because one out of every billion times, the thing that generates this floating point number is not correctly initialized, but it happens so infrequently that I never saw it in testing. Uh, by the way, this is the root cause variance. So does, is everybody familiar with the idea of variance? So the idea is, I think I'm going to get a string that is non-empty, that has numerals and exactly one decimal point in it, and that's the domain in which I expect the data to come. And actually, there's some other thing out here. In this case, none or null, whatever you want to call it. How many people know what cyclomatic complexity is? You see one hand. So the basic idea is every time you see an indentation in that enormous block of code that you can't read, don't try it. It's too small, unless your eyes are way better than mine. Um, you add one. And this is all one function. And yeah, it's my fault. It's way too big. <coughs> and in software engineering, when you're trying to measure code quality, one heuristic people will use will say, let's take the cyclomatic complexity of your functions. And there's a rule of thumb that if your cyclomatic complexity is much above 10, that indicates that your code is a complex state machine and there's probably bugs hiding in there. 
So I wrote this, and you know what? There were no bugs hiding in it. Yeah, it was long, but it worked great. Only thing is, when I ran it, the results it returned, it didn't crash, but the results it returned made no sense to me. So looking at this, when I wrote this, I had an idea of what it was going to do. And in some of those if clauses there, some of them are like, yeah, once in a great while this might happen, but probably not. So you know what? If it does happen, just throw away the data, because it's only one out of every billion rows. Oh, by the way, don't do that. But it turns out, actually, that worked for a while, but then somebody changed something upstream for me, and that thing I thought happened only one in a billion times happened two out of every three times. And suddenly, my mental image of the state machine that was being executed when my code was running was way off. Now, I can't go out and read all billions of executions, but what I can do is I can ask the framework to count them for me, and in particular to count the edges, count at a branch, count at a loop, and go through and say, okay, here's the hot spot in my code. Here's what's really dominating the processing effect. Does that make sense? This is the, the one I'm, I struggle the most to explain. So the next thing that's going to happen is runtime's going to increase. And uh, those of us who got computer science degrees, uh, somewhat belatedly in my case, um, know about exponential algorithms. And that means you either are going to hit a tool chain paddock or you're on your way or else things are just taking along and you're wasting a lot of computing power. Um, <clears throat> a tool chain panic, I, I showed you the text earlier, what it basically means is one of these edges breaks. Sometimes it's one of the green boxes, but usually it's one of the edges between one of the green boxes. And as I said, this is oversimplified. There are way more edges. To lighten the load and prevent your exponential algorithm from taking out your cluster, I suggest four approaches. The first is if you're doing a many-to-many -many comparison, before you begin, localize the data. So if you tell the cluster, I'm going to group by user ID so I can count how many unique users we are, tell the cluster before you do that counting, partition the data on the clusters by user ID. And when you do that, not only will you it mean that all of the user IDs, they're going to be counted multiple times or on one node, it'll also mean that the framework knows that and it won't try and go out across the network to fetch other data. And you'll get an enormous speed up. Um, the other thing that can happen, which I'm not going to discuss real quick, is that you might just have really skewed data and, your alloc and the arbitrary allocation that the cluster does may end up all on one node. <coughs> so let's say that um, you're using your exponential algorithm. Exponential algorithms look awful on the way up, but the secret is that if you turn around and look at them the opposite way, suddenly they look pretty good. If Doubling the data size means that it runs four times slowly. Well, then cutting the data size in half means that it runs twice as fast, excuse me, four times as fast. And so if your function is associative, let's say you're processing a month of data day by day, if you chop it in down into two weeks, you're going to get a four times speed up. I have run over time. I'm not going to discuss sampling. How many of you have uh, done work in statistics? How many of you think I can give you a degree in statistics in one slide? Yeah, me neither. Um, oh, you do. Oh, thank you, sir. You're very gracious. Um, <coughs> statistics is powerful, um, but you have to know how to do it. Um, and then finally, I want to highlight point number two here, which is let's say that you've run your an analytic function, and you're really surprised by the results, and you've double-checked anything, and you can't find any mistakes. Consider the possibility that you did a great job, and you learned something about your data. Thank you. OK, um, so we do have a little bit of extra time just because of all the speakers were so good about keeping to their 20 minutes. So are, are there any questions um, for Sam? Yeah. So I work a lot more often in this sort of paradigm you're talking about. and but I'm also trying to be pretend that I'm a good software engineer and do some good unit testing. What I find impossible is trying to yeah. large data sets, unit tests, trying to find those strange cases yeah. in any way that doesn't take 16 hours or whatever. Listen to this, this guy's sharp. So in an earlier slide, I, I had that line about you can't read 17 million values. And then below it, there was a block that said you're not going to write 17 million unit tests either, right? So. Pre and post conditions and Bertrand Meyer style contract by programming aren't going to work. So what do you do? 
Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, but my favorite thing to do is to do is to combine acceptance testing and monitoring. So acceptance testing is I've written this analytic function or this ETL function and I'm pretty happy with it. And it says that we have 87,314,22 searches in Germany in this month, right? And then I just use that as my acceptance test as I keep going. More interesting to me, it seems to me, fundamentally, is integrating monitoring. So stop thinking of yourself as producing source code and think of yourself as your distributed system is this organism that's out there on the network doing stuff and producing outputs. And what you want is a zookeeper who's going to go along and look at it and say, do you look healthy? So this is not sysadmin style monitoring. It, uh, this is actually end user or client monitoring saying, huh, the line of users in Germany in the month of March just tripled. Did we actually get three times as many you know, users in Germany? So have human beings look at graphs and reports which summarize the whole state of the computation chain? And ideally, most of your code is generating things that people really care about, right? So most of your work is meant to give numbers to people who can make important business decisions. So if they're looking at those decisions, that's a great QA. Now the downside is that some super important person is catching your bugs, so. Yeah. But great question. Other questions? No, anyone? Going once? Going twice? Okay, well thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. So, and uh, thanks to all of you and thanks to, to all the speakers for your, not only uh, giving us great talks, but, but keeping to your time. And uh, thanks to that, there's, there's a break next. And so I invite all of you to uh, go and enjoy that. And thanks for showing up for our, our uh, block of sessions.